Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming out tonight. Um, I'm actually going to be graduating uh, later this month, so I'll be heading out to college here soon. And to kind of talk a little bit more about that, I was invited by some uh, visiting paleontologists. Uh, I'll get into that later, but to check out the La Brea Tar Pits, special behind the scenes preview of the, uh, of the site and the collections in the museum. And pretty much I'll be showcasing that. And I also took a brief trip to the LA County Museum, so I'll briefly touch, touch on that. So last winter, um, there was these two uh, paleontologists from La Brea Tar Pits. They're twins. Um, you have, this is Sean, and this is uh, Bo. And uh, they came here to talk with uh, our current collections member, Kristen McKenzie, about some fossil, microfossil prep techniques. And um, they were walking, or we struck up a conversation, and then I was telling them that I was actually heading to California, you know, in the summer. And they were like, do you want to check out the museum? We'll give you a special tour. And you, you can't believe how excited I was to get offered that. Um, but yeah, before I talk about the trip itself, I want to just talk about you know, uh, the tar pits themselves, what they are, the history of the site and everything. So this is what it looks like today, you know, um, kind of a Mediterranean climate. So you know, when I went, it was uh, particularly hot you know, um, and not much precipitation. But if we go back about a good 50,000 years ago, this is what you would be seeing. Uh, this is what Los Angeles looked like back uh, in the Pleistocene era, and the climate was a lot different. It was a lot more uh, wet and cooler, and um, I'm going to talk about what tar pits actually are. So they're actual um, petroleum uh, seeps that come to the ground um, that are, you know, asphalt, and uh, what happens with these natural traps, like with any natural trap today, is that herbivores would uh, come in, the water would be sitting on top of the asphalt, and herbivore would come up and take a drink, but if he gets his foot stuck in the asphalt, well, he's, he's a goner. And predators come by, you know, they see this free meal that's just uh, sitting there waiting to be eaten, and then they themselves get trapped in as they're trying to capture their captured prey. So tar pits are really good for uh, preserving fossils. Um, for one thing, since the animals, you know, they can't really go anywhere, so it will be kind of in place. And then after death, um, the carcass of the animal you know, kind of sinks through the asphalt rather quickly um, after death. And then with the asphalt, it actually penetrates the bones um, and actually preserves it from, from the bones being, you know, further decayed and broken down. And um, after the animal decays, you know, as the, you know, at least vertebrate fossil, uh, the bones become disassembled and disarticulated. And um, the museum they actually showed here, these are uh, bones from uh, African lion, and they kind of give an idea of what paleontologists see when they're digging this up. So there's multiple layers where uh, different parts of the animal would be just in one flat out layer. There's, they're separated between you know, different lengths. So then I'm just gonna talk about uh, some of the animals that existed during this time. So first ones here. These were, um, they, I mean, both of these look like elephants, but the mastodon is further um, related to the elephant. Um, there were about, you know, 10 to 15, or 8 to 10 tall, you know, about 15 feet, or yeah, 15 feet long, and weighed about, you know, 8,000 to 12 pounds, which is roughly around 4 to 6 tons. Um, but the Columbian mammoth, on the other hand, is, was a true titan because it was one of the biggest uh, land mammals ever to exist. It was about 12 to 15 feet tall shoulder, um, or about 21 feet long, and then, you know, 22,000 pounds, so that's 10 tons. And that's actually bigger than some of the Mesozoic dinosaurs like T-Rex. T-Rex, I believe, was only about 7 tons. So this guy technically was bigger than T-Rex and some of the other dinosaurs that existed. We have our uh, infamous predators. We have um, the saber-toothed cats or the Smilodon. These guys were um, about 3.5 3 feet tall, you know, at their shoulders, so about half the height of a human. Um, about the length of a human as well, you know, kind of similar to the size of an African lion, but their true uh, size comes from, you know, their weight. They're about 350 to 620 pounds, which is at least big in my book as a cat. Um, then we have uh, Direwolf over here. 
Um, surprisingly, these guys, you know, they're the biggest of the dog family, but they're not much bigger than gray wolves that live today. They were a lot more robust and they're about three feet tall, you know, five feet long, almost the same size as the um, Smilodon, but considerably smaller in weight. And then here are some other bigger um, predators. This is the short-faced bear. Um, and this bear was one of the largest, um, one of the largest mammalian carnivores uh, ever to have existed. It was about six feet tall at the shoulders, but when it stood up hind legs, it would have been about 12 feet tall. So really big animal. And then um, it was about a ton weight, or uh, yeah, weight. Then interesting enough, there, there was a species of lion that actually here in the Pleistocene. Uh, it's called the American lion. And uh, it's one of the biggest in the group bats, you know, the Felis family. It was about, you know, between five and eight feet long, you know, about four feet tall. And, you know, kind of similar in size to the Smilodon in terms of weight, about, you know, 500 pounds. Here are some of the strange uh, herbivores. There is um, a type of ground sloth. There was three species, but this was predominantly found in the area. Uh, the Harlan's ground sloth, they were about, again, six feet tall, shoulders, uh, 10 feet long, and then, you know, 1,000 pounds, so that's like half a ton. And then there was the, the ancient bison here. This is the direct ancestors of the modern bison that live today. And they were, you know, between 25% larger than today's bison. So they're actually about 7.5 to 8 feet tall, um, about 15 feet long, and then, um, you know, a ton and a half in weight. And even weirder enough, um, th we had an American camel that lived here. In fact, these two species, as I mentioned here, camels and um, horses actually originated from North America, but their relatives died, you know, died out. And the only ones surviving are, you know, through uh, the Middle East and Europe. Um, so this camel was actually really large. It was about, you know, seven feet tall at the shoulders, you know, nine feet long and almost to a ton in weight. And then uh, we have this western horse here, um, which is not too much larger than a Mustang today. So it's about, you know, five feet tall, eight feet long, and, you know, uh, half or, you know, ton and a half in length. But the most interesting thing I found when I was researching here is that we actually have found human remains at La Brea. There's only been one uh, human remain found, you know, back at, you know, the early 20th century. Um, it was a female woman. Um, she was around four foot seven, so pretty small, and then her age is kind of so some paleontologists believe she's, you know, between seven and 18 years old, or some people think she's a lot older, um, you know, 25 to 30 years old, and her cause of death is unknown, at least as scientists. Some people believe she was uh, murdered. Some people believed uh, off a, a fossil dog that was found nearby the woman that this was a part of a ritual, you know, like an official ritual, but a recent paper last year kind of disputed this by actually dating of the woman to being about, you know, 10,000 years old, while the, the dog that was found nearby was about 7,000 years older. So at least that possibility is counted off. And then I'm just going to talk about the history of La Brea, you know, in human history. So early Los Angeles, you know, this is kind of if you go back about a good uh, 100 years ago, uh, this is what Los Angeles would have looked like. And uh, the citizens here actually used the asphalt from the tar pits nearby to, uh, you know, um, waterproof their house and uh, use the tar pit as fuel. And then um, before joining the United States, California was kind of made up of a bunch of land grants that were given to, you know, farmers who own ranches and uh, farms. And one of these ranches that I highlight right here is... Uh, La Brea, so it's called Rancho La Brea. Um, and then in terms of discovery, um, back at the early 19th century, this uh, gentleman right here, M William Denton, he was visiting uh, Rancho La Brea when family, or the owners of the, the land gave him this, which is a saber-toothed canine. And he was the first person to identify fossils from this site. But if we travel about 20 to 30 years later, uh, it gains a lot more attention. So um, this another man, also named William, he was an oil geologist working around the area, and uh, he found a lot more specimens, you know, like saber-toothed cats, uh, dire wolves, you know, 
different species of, of ground sloths and other fossils. And then he gave it to a um, professor named uh, John Miriam. He uh, worked at the University of California, Berkeley, and he uh, was the first person to actually write a true um, scientific publication on the fossils there. And after this publication, the uh, significance and noticing of the site became a lot more apparent to some of these other paleontologists. And then excavation started to go around. Um, they gave the rights to the Los Angeles Museum, which recently was established at this point. And uh, they were able to dig the sites for about you know two years, from 1913 to 1915. And uh, during that time, they actually found you know, over a million fossils and named over 300 species of animals and plants. But a majority of them, the large um, mammals that you know, we know of like the mammoths, mastodons, and whatnot. So then this is today, this is uh, one of the recent current excavations. This is called uh, Project 23. It came about in 2006 when um, the LA County Museum of Art was building an uh, underground plot and they actually came across uh, about 16 deposits of uh, Ice Age um, animals and uh, the the museum didn't have much time to collect these, so what they actually did is they actually made wooden boxes to encase each uh, fossil or fossil deposit, and um, there were about 23 boxes built to collect the deposits by, it's called Project 23. And uh, one of the, the site, you know, this is Pit 13 or, or Box 13. This is um, one that I actually got to look at, and uh, this is a whole dire wolf footage uh, of different individuals and right here you can kind of see you know this is a dire popula right here this is part of a dire wolf denerary or the jawbone this right here is a vertebra right here is the uh, distal end I believe of uh, femur and uh, one of their oldest and most uh, known sites is uh, pit 13 and this was also um, worked on during that two-year excavation it has a whole history of kind of being shut down and open and shut down and open um, originally, they were planning to be a visitor center so people can see what these animals look like when they're first found by paleontologists, but um, with a bunch of flooding and cave-ins, they decided to close the site, but then reopened it back in, you know, 1969 uh, to collect more fossils, not only, you know, macro fossils, like the big mammal micro fossils, so like, you know, plants, uh, birds, reptiles, and amphibians and stuff like that, and then, um, it closed again in 1980 due to budget issues, but when the um, 1948 or the yeah 1984 Olympics took place, the site became really popular. And then uh, from then to today, they have been working, you know, 10 to 12 weeks out of the summer in this site. And then um, right here, are some of the things they found from here. And um, I actually got a good picture here, how well you can see it, but. Right here, there's about you know flags inside the pit, which actually indicate um, certain mammal bones. So if you can see right here, there's a flag here. This is um, from a Harlan grounds. It's, uh, I believe it's the pelvis. The orange here, this is uh, a dire wolf scab. The red flag here, which is probably most noticeable, is a western horse humerus, so the upper arm bone. And uh, the green, which is right next to it, is um, a smilodon scapula. And then when we got the look, this is one of the uh, biggest founds from the Project 23 site. This is a uh, Colombian mammoth named uh, Zed. And he's one of the most complete um, Colombian mammoths ever to have been discovered. It's really only missing one, a single vertebra and pieces of the skull. I believe part of the top was um, cut off excavator. And uh, the, f the bones were found to be uh, semi-articulated, so they were loose, you know, some parts were connected to how the animal would have been in life and other parts were just jumbled across like with that uh, demonstration with the modern African lion thing. And then uh, here's actually the jaw of Zed. And uh, we actually got to see the actual skull of Zed. And you can see here there's uh, some tar leaking out of the skull, kind of indicating, you know, that the tar seeps into the bones when the animal dies and kind of just fills the pores up. And here's me and uh, Sean. Oh, no, it's actually Bo. And he's explained to me here um, 
move on to the next one. It's kind of hard to see, but right here, he was explaining to me some of these skulls they have. This is a short-faced bear skull, um, an American lion skull, and a dire wolf skull. And it doesn't look like it from these pictures. Skulls are actually really huge. The, the short-faced bear skull was probably about this long. You know, it's just bear species known. And then, oh, then the American lion skull, I think, is around this length, so about a good foot and a half. So these were large animals. And then uh, the other uh, collection areas, these are all uh, ancient bison pieces, so you can see uh, right there is jaw. You can see numerous places that the, the horns are there. And this, uh, if you don't know anything about kind of um, paleontology collections, that this is a really unorthodox way of storing fossils. What we normally do is we actually take a plaster, um, we make a plaster kind of uh, called a cradle, and it supports the fossil because if a fossil is left on a shelf without anything to support it, over hundreds of years, gravity will act upon the fossil and actually break it down. But with these, um, this is to support it, but they've been working um, on making more um, cradles, as we'll see here in a little bit. This is actually the skull of a, um, a ground sloth. It looks rather unusual, and I'm not actually sure about the end as well, but you can obviously see some teeth. This is, this is probably the uh, orbit here. And then, um, I didn't take this picture. My um, chief preparator of the museum here, Mike Getty, uh, showed me some of the pictures from the collections that I just wanted to show off. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, Smilodon skulls there. And then, uh, this is what I was talking about. This is what a traditional uh, cradle looks like. It's made you know, out of plaster and is used to support the fossil in areas where gravity might damage it. So these are all, uh, I believe, still more of uh, the bison, you know, a whole bunch of ribs right here, some vertebra, more ribs down here. And then uh, we didn't get a chance to look at the actual museum itself, but just for your guys' purposes, I would just show you what was in the museum and kind of compare it to um, some of the animals I was talking about, and so you get an idea of fossils. So. This is the American Mastodon that's on display at the museum. So this is a, uh, a female, presumably, and a baby, I think about six months old. And um, they're rare in the tar pits. They only found about 15 individuals, including uh, said baby. Uh, then the Columbia Mammoth, you know, as you can kind of see here, it was immensely large, you know, speaking to what I was here. This was a male individual. Um, probably, you know, due to the tusk length, I believe, and males being driven to females. And during my research, I couldn't exactly find an exact number for uh, individual and um, specimen count, but they have said they've found several uh, Columbian mammoths, so at least they found some. And then, you know, we have the saber-tooth cat here, or Smilodon, and um, I can't really tell the sex of this individual because with uh, saber tooth, the sexual dimorphism, which is the differences in the species between males and females, is very subtle to none, and it can only be monomorphic, which is pretty much there's no differences between male and female. Um, over 2,000 individuals, 130,000 specimens of the Smilodon were collected from Librea, and it makes one of the most well known uh, species found. So, and then this is also the second most numerous uh, animal found at this site. And it's. Uh, Second to the dire wolf. The dire wolf, uh, this is a whole wall. They've been here to La Brea. This is, they have a whole wall of over 400 individual skulls there, kind of sh showcasing the commonality with them. And um, as I was saying, they're the most common fall found, you know, over 4,000 or 400, or yeah, 4,000 individuals and over 20,000 specimens. And the reason that we find so many more. Um, carnivores here than herbivores goes back to when I was in the tar pits is that when a herbivore gets stuck in the tar pits, you know, animals like Smilodon and Dire were generally pack animals and, you know, the whole pack would probably jump right in to, you know, catch this prey, but as I, they would all get stuck, so this explains their numerous appearances. And then uh, showing the, the short bear here, um, this one is a little bit smaller, um, so I assumed it was a female. Is, Male um, short-faced bears are about 25% larger than females, and uh, which this is a common trait with bear species in general. So they're very uh, 
dimorphic, and then over about the individuals and 700 specimens were collected. And this is due to, you know, bears being kind of solitary creatures, not really being part of a pack. So the amount that are going in is probably going to be a lot less. And um, we have the American lion here. This is a adult individual, and it's the same with uh, Smilodon. It's the um, their, their uh, dimorphism is really subtle to almost none, so there's really not much differences between the males and the females. And uh, 100 and 200 individuals were covered. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the short-faced bear, where there are scary creatures, but with the American lion, it's kind of debated given that they're you know, related to lions and tigers, Maladon, who are you know, pack hunting animals. So the, the uh, decision on how if pack animals or not is still being debated. Then uh, here's the Harlan ground sloth, and um, same thing as with the, the saber-toothed cat, their dimorphism is very little to none. Uh, and there's about you know, 76 individuals that have been found. Um, you'll see a trend here where the herbivores are a lot less common in these sites than the carnivores. And then we have the uh, ancient bison here. So this was male adult because it's currently unknown if female um, ancient bison had horns like they do, and since this one has horns, it should be indicated that it's uh, a male. And over 300 individuals have been collected, including a lot of younger, um, like young animals, and making them the most abundant herbivores of the area. And then we have the camelops, the ancient um, camel, and um, they determined this was the male because the um, limb bones are a little bit more robust than the males than they are in the females. And like the Mastodon, there's been no really exact number given, but sort of like the Mastodon, they've said numerous um, of these animals. And then lastly is the uh, Western horse. And there, are, there is indication of sexual dimorphism between these animals. There's a lot of uh, and website articles like to claim, you know, um, but what those differences are, they haven't actually said so. I'm just going with the individual for here, and over 200 individuals have been found, and mostly like um, camelops, there's been young individuals, and then when they do find adult specimens, they find that males actually outnumber the females two to one, um, which I think is interesting. So that was the uh, kind of La Brea history, and then I'm going to briefly talk about you know the Natural History Museum, of Los Angeles County, or you know the LA County Museum, as I like to say it. Um, to talk about this briefly. So the entrance I went to, you know, there's a blue whale skeleton, I believe, but I'm not certain. When you walk in, you see this really amazing display here where um, it's a T-Rex fighting a triceratops. Um, much information on the specimen numbers or where they came from. I believe they came from Montana um, for certain. And then uh, these are some pictures from the lab. This is part of a sauropod pelvis. And while they didn't switch uh, portion of the pelvis this is. I believe it's the pubis, you know, kind of right here, kind of matches the shape, you know, if this is um, here, it kind of has the curve there. But I'm not certain. And then um, they had a T-Rex maxilla there. Research really hard to see if um, what this, this is a cast, but I was researching what this cast is from, but I wasn't able to find out. But I instead just showed you for people who don't know well uh, know as much as about anatomy. That skull is right here, so it's kind of the upper um, upper skull where most of the teeth would be placed. And then uh, when you walk into the dinosaur exhibit, you see this uh, giant triceratops here. So it was about 25 feet in length. An interesting thing about this is um, this is found, I think, in Bozeman, Wyoming. But this skeleton here, while it looks in a uniform, this is actually made up of uh, four individuals that have been found around the same site. You know. And here is a diagram of the uh, composites of the skeleton. So you see um, this, this first one, this is what this whole composite is named after, LACM, which is LA County Museum. Um, majority of the skulls there, some of the cervical vertebra and, you know, the whole arm. And then, you know, part of the scapula here, a lot of the ribs and hip section and part of the, you know, hip and more uh, dorsal vertebra. And then this is a really cool dinosaur, Ichasaurus. It's uh, incredibly large. It's uh, actually from China. This is 
one of the only casts that's are in, in that exhibit because given this animal's size, putting an animal that probably would have been about 60 or 70 tons in life, you know, probably even more with the fossils being heavy on it, probably be a safety concern. But one of the interesting things about it is that it has one of the longest necks of any animal known. Um, the animal is about 68 feet in length, but the neck itself is about 31, so that's almost half of the animal's length. Uh, it had 19 extended cervical vertebrae. Um, then there was this um, kind of mosasaur, uh, plesiosaur animal they found here. And at a glance, it doesn't really look anything interesting. You know, just an animal that you know, died on the seafloor and, you know, its specimen is showed. But when you look really into it, it's incredibly interesting because this plesiosaur was actually pregnant and actually has some of the, the um, offspring inside of the cavity. And this is the first case of a plesiosaur actually showing to give live birth instead of um, legs. And this was found in Kansas um, around 78, it was lived around 78 million years ago. Um, the adult was about 15 feet long and the embryo was about, you know, 4.5 feet long. Um, a majority of the, the adult was found besides the, uh, the part of the neck and the skull, as you see here, um, that's absent, but all the light brown material shown here is what was found, and then the dark brown material here was uh, part of the embryo. And then in the paper that described this fossil, we hypothesized that given that unlike other animals, you know, like sharks, um, that give, you know, have individuals, you know, when they give live birth, that since this only has one, you know, offspring thing, it might indicate that this animal would, it would have cared for its young, you know, in a way to, you know, whales today, how they watch over their young for a good number of times. So the parent probably would have been around the, the offspring for a good majority of its first few years. No, uh, this is one of my favorite dinosaurs. It's called the uh, Carnotaurus. And, uh, this name is intentional. I'll explain here in a little bit, but the, this is a theropod dinosaur that lived in uh, prehistoric Argentina around seven million years ago. Uh, ten feet long, or ten, ten feet tall, um, twenty-five to thirty feet long, and the skull, unlike most theropods, like if you saw the Tyrannosaurus skull earlier, it's a lot more short and deep, so it's a lot more taller in length, and its characteristic feature is it actually has. Lat laterally facing horns. Um, but the reason I call the horn cheetah is because a study was done studying the um, caudal vertebra from Carnotaurus. And right here, this is the typical theropod um, verte caudal vertebra, and this is what the muscles around the tail would look like. Um, but in this one, this is what Carnotaurus' um, tail vertebra looked like. Its um, caudal processes actually extend upwards in a V shape, which uh, would allow for a certain muscle called the, I can't remember what it's called exactly, it's from the tail to the back of the femur and the pelvis, and it would allow it for be a lot m larger size, which helps with uh, the animals running because this muscle helps pull the leg back. And we think, you know, paleontologists believe that um, along with its Unusually, um, if I go back here, it has unusual long legs compared to its body size. Along with these, it could have been one of the fastest theropods ever to have existed. Um, you know, speeds around 30 to 35 miles per hour. Um, then the last one I'm going to talk about is um, the one and only um, Tyrannosaur growth series that the museum displayed. It's the only one in the world. Um, I labeled different parts here. Number one, this is a baby Tyrannosaurus. It was about two years old, um, about 11 feet long, and so far it's the youngest T. rex we've heard so far. And then right here, um, we have a juvenile uh, Tyrannosaur, about 13 years old in age, and it doubled its size during that time. You know, it was about 20 feet long and was about tons in weight. Um, then this one here, I believe this is an original specimen that the L.A. County Museum found. It's a subadult Tyrannosaurus called um, Thomas. He was about 17 years old in age, and he's tripled his size in about, you know, a few years com compared to when it was a baby. 34 feet long, so almost the maximum size of T. rex, you know, which is about 45 feet long in length, fully grown, and uh, it was about 7,000 pounds, so about 3.5 tons. 
And then this fossil is actually 70 original material, which is incredible in the paleontological community because T. rexes are often found you know, parts and different specimens, and it's up there with uh, tyrannosaurs such as and Stan as uh, one of the most um, complete tyrannosaurs ever discovered. And then going over some acknowledgments, I wanted to personally thank Bo and Sean for inviting me to Chebrea. I wanted to thank you guys, Whips, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And then lastly, I wanted to thank all my friends and family who supported me through my long journey as a four-year-old crazing about doors today where I'm actually giving a talk. Um, I wanted to thank all my friends and family for supporting me all the way through, and I appreciate it. And I'll answer, or answer any questions if you guys have them. Yeah, so uh, the question was that how many tar pits they are and how do they remove the material, I believe. And um, currently, that wasn't really a topic of my research. I was more looking into the animals that were there and kind of what was found. I believe there were about two or three, well, there's seven, I know for sure, but um, the exact number I don't know off the top of my head. And then, you know, with any other, you know, dig sites that deal with, you know, sandstone or clay or whatever, they probably would dispose of the tar, you know, it's just at, like dried asphalt, you know, and it's liquid tar um, form that the animals got stuck in, because after thousands of years, the tar would kind of harden, you know, the asphalt, so they probably would dispose of it, as with any paleontological excavation, you know, I don't think there's any differences there, and I think they can, you know, even sell the tar, you know, to people who are invested in buying that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, um, I didn't include it in the presentation, but during our little tour, they actually had a little uh, pit there, a tar pit, and they had sticks by it. A good, spent a good 10, 15 minutes just poking at the tar <laughs> with this stick because I've never really known what the company was like, so I found that highly entertaining. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, this was on one day, you know, we uh, spent a good five hours at the La Brea Tar Pits and then uh, spent a good three hours um, at the L.A. County Museum. It was all in one day because we had a whole bunch of other stuff we were while we were in California, so. Well, I really learned, you know, um, just kind of like, I'm a very visual learner and kind of on and actually, you know, it, there's a difference, I believe, um, in reading about this textbook and actually seeing it and holding it and experiencing it, you know, I think it's an imme immense uh, educational experience and it actually is really helpful for those who are really, you know, going into science and to kind of see this stuff, touch this stuff, you know, go into this stuff, you know. You learn a lot more, I believe, having these experiences than just reading about it in a textbook. Um, so the education, this whole trip was very valuable to me. Yeah. It kind of smelled like typical asphalt, you know, it's kind of expected, but the smell wasn't too terrible. There, there still is animals that get trapped in the tar pits, but they're small, you know, vertebrates, you know, so, or invertebrates, invertebrates, like bugs, birds, lizards and stuff. So, um, Luckily, since there's no large mammals being trapped, there's no sense of decay flesh around the park. Otherwise, I'm sure no one would ever go except the scientists. Yeah. Yeah, so that was something I didn't really want to talk about during this, uh, this talk. You know, the, the, he was asking if the juvenile Tyrannus was a nano Tyrannus. And to kind of give some background around that, there is a uh, Tyrannosaurus named that's at the Cleveland Museum, I believe. And there's a whole debate between if the juvenile, go back a little bit, um, talking about this individual right here, a debate between if 
this individual here is uh, its own species, Nanotyrannus, or if it's uh, juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, I don't really want to share opinion, but I'm just going off the base of evidence that um, it's a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. But you know, people who believe the side of Nanotyrannus is its own valid genus can say what they want. But um, at least interpretation, I believe it's just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. I'm not going to call it an individual, but that's to debate. But it's one of the most highly debated topics in paleontology, you know. It's never been resolved, and it's kind of been going on for a while, but. Any more questions? All right, thank you.